Today I'm on a hunt for something that I haven't seen so far this year, or at least this winter, and that's snow. But to find snow, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of mountain climbing. Not me climbing any mountains, but in fact, going up the mountain to go ahead and see it. And since this is what I have in the driveway, I figured this would be a great vehicle to take along with me. But there are a lot of questions about electric vehicles, not only when you drive them in the cold, because even down here at sea level, it's about 40 degrees right now, but what happens when you get up into elevation and how does this handle a climb? And what happens when you're coming down the hill? And I figured I'm gonna go ahead and explore all of those today, grab a little empirical and data, and for me to do so, it's time for me to hit the road. The current batch of EVs for sale have a lot going for them, and a lot of features that make them great companions for a trip up the mountains. In most cases, you can get a dual motor, all wheel drive layout that provides a lot of power, but also plenty of traction. And it's also power that's not gonna fall off as you gain an elevation, which is something you can get with an internal combustion engine. They also have a lot of standard features or more standard features than it seems in other models, things like heated steering wheels and heated seats, because the idea here is to do more zone heating than all cabin heating and save some electricity. Because it's not all sunshine and roses, there are some challenges, but that's one way to counter it, and right now I'm enjoying that heated seat quite a bit. One of the biggest things available to EV owners that is going to make them feel a lot more comfortable with their drive is gonna be the ability for the car to tell you at least assume how much electricity you'll have when you get to your destination. So I started this trip with just about 88% of the uh, battery charged up. My range right now, as it states at 81, is listed at about 170 miles. My trip is going to be about 27 miles, a lot of elevation gain between now and then, and I should get there with about 61% battery. And if I asked it to, it would tell me how much power it thought I would have when I got back down the mountain, or at least the same spot I started from. And this is something that should help people feel a lot more at ease because again, the big question is what happens? And the reason that's a big concern is because the abundance of EV charging stations is not nearly what you get for gas stations. And when you stop and charge at an EV station, it's not nearly as quick as a five, 10 minute fill up as you would get, especially if you only need a gallon of gas, right? You're gonna have more time processing your credit card than it is gonna be to actually fill that vehicle up. And when I stopped, just before I hit the road here uh, to fill up, I charged it as far as I could to make sure I did indeed end up with electricity on my way back. And to get to 93% charge took a long time because anything over that 75% mark really slows down the charge rate. And that's just not efficient nor fun and not something that people are really gonna wanna do. But the reason I filled up is because most people start their day in an electric vehicle with a full charge. So I'm assuming for this experiment that we've left our house with a full charge because it was charging in the garage overnight. And we'll just see how quick and easy or difficult it is to be able to make this trip. But since I'm gonna get there with over 50%, I expect we'll be okay. And the big reason that over 50% is at least like the bare minimum is because coming down, I should use a lot less electricity because of regenerative braking. Regenerative braking doesn't mean that I'm going to fill this car back up on the way down, but it means I'm gonna use a lot less electricity. So even if I ended up with 40% when I got to the top of the hill, I would be pretty comfortable in assuming that I would use you know, at least 20% less on the way back down than I did on the way up, and that should give me a pretty good data set. But again, we'll find out, and that's the whole reason we're doing this. For the rest of this trip, I don't anticipate actually running into any snow on the ground, which would end up impacting your range because your vehicle's gonna have to work harder to get through that snow. But I didn't wanna run into any uh, issues getting this vehicle stuck because we are due for some new tires, but that'll probably be a different video down the road. And so I picked a clear day. It should be a beautiful drive. I also have data to compare against this trip to tell you what the difference really is because I also just finished an over 800 mile road trip from California up here to Washington and that's going to be a pretty good baseline for what you should expect for regular travel. That one obviously ups and downs, but a lot more flat than what I'm expecting here. I'm going to get back to the driving, but I'll see you at the top of the mountain.
Well, so far I've got nothing but good news. I found the snow that I was looking for, which is fantastic and exactly what I needed. I also found a parking spot that's not too far away that it's unplowed and I risk getting stuck on the way either in or out. It's also far enough away so that you don't hear the idling diesel trucks that are themselves trying to keep warm. So you can hear me for better or worse. There was a fun little surprise here in this parking space. As you might notice behind me, there are a couple charging cabinets because there are DC fast chargers just off to my left. One of them currently occupied by a Ford F-150 Lightning, so I'm not the only EV crossing the pass, but it's also a great testament to ways you can use your time while you're charging because the gentleman there is practicing his ukulele, which I can't think of a better time to do so than waiting for your car to charge. But it got here with about 60% power, and that's exactly what it expected to do. 61%, I'm currently sitting at 58 because of that driving around and sitting in the car for a few minutes because it is a little bit chilly out here. But what surprised me, just because I hadn't checked that number, nor had I really anticipated it, took about 50% more energy to get up the hill than it did to do the entire drive. And I don't obviously mean cumulative energy, I mean the total efficiency, but 50% more is probably right in the ballpark I would have expected. I'll get the exact number here at the very end of the video um, when I go ahead and run down all the numbers, but Needless to say, I got here with the energy that I needed. And if I was out here skiing all day or out snowboarding or with the family doing some inner tubing, knowing that I have over 50% while it sits here for a couple hours is perfectly comfortable to me. Again, going down the mountain, I should use a lot less energy. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do is head down the mountain. As soon as I'm done taking a closer look at how long the vehicle actually can sit here, while it's freezing and you being able to stay warm inside. So just in case you get stuck in a blizzard, I'm gonna go ahead and test that out. Although hopefully no blizzards are on their way. But needless to say, our trip is nearly done. The hard part is already over. Now for the fun part, the downhill portion and the vehicle estimates as expected that this will take less energy to get down than it did to get up. Shocker, I know. What I'm most curious about is actually gonna be how the regenerative braking plays into this. Because regenerative braking means that I can get electricity back, which ultimately means that I use less electricity. But I'm also curious how little of my brake pedal I can use. And instead of putting this on cruise control and letting the car do all of the figuring, I'm gonna go ahead and leave this on manual, so to speak. And I'm gonna use the one pedal driving to use as little brake as possible, maximize the regenerative potential, and uh, just see how that goes. Obviously, if I need to jump in for a safety reason or a harder brake application, that's what the brake is for. But I'm just curious to see how we can do while staying at or below the speed limit. I get to my starting spot, grab all the data that I need, and then head on home where I will pick up with you in just a second. I made it back down the mountain without any issues and I got all the data that I needed. But the first thing I wanna do is actually make a small correction. I think right around the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I was about sea level and it turns out after checking the maps, I was right about a thousand feet. So certainly not sea level, but not miles above it. What we did end up doing is going to about 3,600 feet. So that's about a 2,600 elevation change that's gonna be up and down. And that's obviously going to affect the efficiency of the vehicle, which is exactly what we're here to test. For comparison purposes, I'll use the two road trips that I've taken in this Volvo. That's going to be between Washington and California, and that's going to be to and from the home offices in San Jose. Now, shortly after I shot this video, I went back down to San Jose. So thanks to a little bit of movie magic, we have other points of reference. But here we are, and this is where we'll get started. Going up that mountain took a lot more energy than it did coming down. Just checking my notes here, we went 38.8 miles and an average 1.7 miles per kilowatt hour. That's about 69% of what I got on those two road trips if we average that out at about 2.6 miles per kilowatt hour. But honestly, I thought it might've come out a little bit worse. In the 38.8 miles that I drove, it used about 21.7 kilowatt hours. So that is not an insignificant amount. But the big win is when we're coming back down the hill. And for the 37.5 miles that we took on the route back, we used only 8.5 kilowatt hours, which means we were at about 170% 
of the average efficiency, meaning we hit 4.44 miles per kilowatt hour, which is a great easy number, um, but one that I was a little bit surprised about. It's not like I didn't expect it to be way more efficient, but it's one of those things where just seeing these numbers makes it a little bit more real for me. And obviously this is way, way more efficient. One thing I mentioned on the way down the mountain was that I wasn't gonna use cruise control at all on the way down, but I use it all the way up just to make sure that I was at that speed and it was nice and consistent. But I did the same thing on the way back I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't using any friction braking if I didn't have to, which means all of the slowing down happened via regenerative braking. I did not touch the brake pedal a single time. And that's obviously going to lead towards some of that efficiency because anytime you're using friction braking, you're not using any of that regenerative capacity or you're using less of it depending on the situation. This does have a blended braking system. So even if I press the brakes, it would regenerate until it needed more. But the point stands that setting the vehicle at the speed limit manually, I just stayed at the same speed everyone else was going and the posted speed limit mean, meant that I got the most out of that efficiency. And again, at 171%, it really does show. Now, when I look at this drive as a whole, both up and down, what was most impressive to me is how close I got to the average efficiency of my trip from California up to Washington. It does come in a little bit short of the overall average, but it's a small margin and honestly one that can probably be attributed to the overall temperature because when I was coming up from California, it was not freezing or below, but this one, it certainly was. Although if you check the cold video that we posted shortly after this one, you can see that it doesn't necessarily take that much more power to heat the cabin. It's just some of these other components that are gonna be in consideration for an overall trip. So where does it leave us? Well, for me, it's just putting numbers to something that we all pretty much expected, which is that when you go up and down a mountain, it's going to use more up, less down, and overall average out pretty evenly. The only thing to consider is if you are taking your electric vehicle up to the mountains, up over the pass, going out skiing, then you wanna make sure you leave yourself a few more percentage when it comes to things like heating or if you're gonna be traveling through the snow. Again, in this case, I had totally clear roads, so I wasn't having to do any driving through the snow, but obviously that's gonna be something that lowers your overall efficiency. Beyond that, I stand by what I said at the beginning of the video, which is that if I have to go up and over a mountain pass, I'd probably like to be in an electric vehicle if that is at all an option. The only caveats are I want to make sure that I can make that trip with the rated range or the expected range of the vehicle, knowing that if a vehicle says it'll go 250 miles, that's not going to be 250 highway miles. That's going to be closer to maybe 200. And then I might want to factor in, like I said, a little more, more energy, maybe 180 miles round trip to make sure that I'm going to be just fine in case things get really, really cold. The other thing is that the vehicle I take in this condition, I want to make sure that it has a heat pump if possible. And that's not something I was able to compare apples to apples. I did not have a heat pump or a pumpless system, but just knowing that that heat pump is way more efficient means that you're not going to be worried about losses or experiencing losses in efficiency when you are making a trip such as this. Plus with an EV, you probably have heated seats. That's a very common standard feature in EVs these days. Certainly one that I appreciate, heated steering wheel in many of them, and honestly, tons of passing power if you find yourself needing it. If you are in the snow, just make sure you are careful. Thank you so much for watching. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, or concerns you might have, go ahead and leave those down in the comment section below. And until next time, let's see you down the road.